My name is Matthew Sibigtroth. I'm a UX prototyper on uh, Google's Chrome UX team, and I'm here today to talk about the physical web, um, namely the problem that it's trying to solve and um, the proposed solution that we're presenting to solve that problem. And I'd like to preface this talk by saying this is not a Google product. This is um, not something we're shipping. This is an experimental spec um, that we're putting out to the community and that we hope would someday be eventually adopted as a, as a standard in some form like this. So but what is the, what is the problem that uh, we're trying to solve? Well, it's related to, it's related to devices and specifically the fact that they're just, there's so many darn many of them. They're all over, and I mean smart devices. Um, and the fact that there just keeps being more and more of them every day, like the, the amount of devices that we're interacting with just seems to keep growing. But so, so what, why is, that, why is that a problem? Well, if you look at kind of the Internet of Things state of the art, or like the hot devices that are out there right now, like the Philips Hue light bulb, the Fitbit wearable, or even the, the Y Things body scale. You know, these are super awesome devices. They're kind of really showcasing all these really cool things that Internet of Things can do. These are super cool, right? But one thing these things have in common, and in fact, share with many of the Internet of Things devices that are out there right now, is that they all require an app to interact with them. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, that's super awesome. I mean, you can build like super delightful, lovely, beautiful experiences um, to interact with these things. And um, that's what apps are for, right? I love apps, they're great. But if we believe, you know, kind of current predictions about um, the number of Internet of Things devices that we imagine to be in the world, like there's some predictions by like 2020 it'll be between 20 and 50 billion. I mean, no one really knows. People are really bad at predicting the future, but I think we can agree that um, there will be a lot and a lot more than there are today. So if that's true, then do we really expect people to install an app for each device they're interacting with. They're walking around in the future and there's hundreds or thousands of these devices. They're not necessarily interacting with all of them, but a significant amount. Do we really want people to have to install them? This kind of idea is um, kind of heavy handed and cumbersome and then you have like app curation that you have to go through and you have to find your apps and deal with them. And That's worked pretty well up until now, but we're wondering if that might break down once um, there's so many more devices. So it's interesting in, uh, you know, in the 90s, Yahoo went through something similar to this. So get ready for flashback here. So you, originally when they were presenting web links to people, they were basically pigeonholing them based on content of the page. So for example, they'd say, all right, this page, they'd go through it and say, this is mostly about art, so we'll put it in the art section. Or this page is mostly about sports, so we'll put it in the sports section. Um, and that worked really well for a relatively small number of links, but as the web grew and grew to millions and many more links, this model wasn't really sustainable, it didn't scale well, it made it harder and harder for people to find what they were looking for. I mean, you basically would have to, the, the more links there were, the more, the more trouble it was to actually find what you were looking for. And so you'd have to change your tree here, like you'd maybe add more levels to this tree, it just, it, it didn't be, it wasn't a sustainable model for finding what, you're, what you wanted. And that led kind of to this paradigm shift that we're all familiar with now. So if we st step back to what uh, I was mentioning earlier about all these Internet of Things devices all needing an app to interact with them. So we can kind of see how that applies to something like iBeacon. And iBeacon is this really cool device that does something really simple. All it does is broadcast its presence to things nearby, right? But the thing about iBeacon is that you have to have, in order to interact with this device, to discover it and interact with it, you have to have the app that was built to work with that iBeacon. So, but so what? So why, why does that matter? Well, let's look at an example. So like say you're at the mall and there's like 15 stores at the mall and each of them has an iBeacon installed in their store. Now in order for you to get the full mall iBeacon experience across all the stores, you would have to install 15 different apps. And you could say, well, I'm not going to go to all the stores, but th that's not the point. The point is that like it's, it, it, it scales linearly, right? Like you have to, you'd have to literally go in and every store you went into that you want to have the experience, you have to install the app for that. And we're, we're guessing that that's kind of a, uh, a cumbersome, painful UX process that uh, people probably won't want to put up with after a certain, a certain uh, number of apps. So what kind of interactions could we propose that would maybe solve this problem? So what if, instead of 
all these devices that are out there that are uh, requiring apps to interact with them, what if instead of having an app to interact with them, all these things did was broadcast a URL? So in this case, a zip card is broadcasting a URL. That way, when a person came up to it, they could just bring up their phone and realize that that device is broadcasting a URL and then navigate to that page, in this case, the Zipcar sign up and pay page. And then after they paid, they're literally unlocking the car and getting in and driving away, all without installing an app, all without um, having anything left over on their phone afterwards. Very um, interaction on demand. And this is what we're calling the physical web. It's basically taking all the superpowers of the web, or at least some of them or most of them, and stuffing it into the physical world. And so when you do something like this, uh, it's a pretty simple idea, but um, it's kind of cool. Like a lot of new, fascinating ways of interacting with all these things around us totally changes. You get these new UX patterns that emerge. So for example, like I could be at a museum and go up to a sculpture and learn, I could you see that's broadcasting URL and learn who the sculptor was, um, learn the history of the sculpture, learn how it actually got to the museum even maybe. Or I could go to a movie poster. I could all of a sudden be watching a movie trailer for this movie. Or, well you've probably already seen this movie, but um, you could get movie times. You could maybe even buy a movie ticket or watch related movies. Or this is kind of a cool one. You could maybe go up to a robotic toy and instantly start controlling it and playing with it, all just through going through the URL. Or maybe someone lost their luggage, and this luggage could be broadcasting their address and name. Maybe it's a little creepy, but the idea is that you could find it and return it to the person. <laughs> maybe this is a better case where you have um, your, your, your lost pet. It broadcasts its name, um, your name, and its, and its address, so it can be returned safely. Or if you happen to have a ridiculously complicated toaster oven that you don't know how to operate, you could go to that URL to watch a tutorial video or um, learn more about the toaster, maybe even learn how to repair it or just general support. So there's lots of, all this, lots of these cool interactions that are emerging, right, just from the simple broadcasting of a URL. But then the other part of layering this discovery service on top of the web is that we get all the, all the cool properties of the web for free. So in one property of the web, the reason why it's so amazing is that it's not centralized, right? It's totally decentralized. There's not one central server that everything has to go through, at least not yet, hopefully, right? And um, really, under this system, under the web, and under this physical web, any device can point to any URL can po on any server. And that's awesome. And one of the reasons it's awesome is because that means it automatically accommodates growth. So we're, if we're predicting there's this the Cambrian explosion of devices that is starting to happen or will happen soon, the vir by virtue of the net being what it is and being decentralized and open, it'll instantly accommodate this uh, proliferating set of devices. Um, so, it, which would otherwise, I mean, versus if it was a central, going through a centralized server, there might otherwise be a bottleneck, that's the point. So, but how would this work? So I've kind of talked about these things that are just broadcasting URLs, but like, what's the kind of, what's the experience like, right? So, if you're walking around and there are like some smart Internet of Things devices, maybe just like a few of them, it probably wouldn't bother you too much if like your phone was buzzing, like these things were like, hey, I'm here, come see me, and then that's fine. But we realized right away that if, if it's true that there will be hundreds or thousands of these things around, that, oh my God, if you were walking around and you're constantly getting pinged and buzzed and like, hey, come see me, I, I have a great deal, hey, come interact with me, you'd be like, I hate the Internet of Things, and so it would be, it would be a wretched experience. Um, so we think it's gotta be much more user driven and opt in. So for example, in this case, if the user walks up to some smart devices or wonders if there are smart devices nearby, they can simply bring up their phone which will give a list of those nearby devices. Now in this case, it's only three devices so it's pretty easy to show them but imagine if there were hundreds of them and you're interested in knowing what devices were nearby, well you'd probably want to rank them or sort them. And kind of the first pass we've taken at sorting them is based on proximity. So the devices that are nearest to you would be sorted towards the top. And you can imagine though, um, you could have a much more sophisticated ranking sorting algorithm. So for example, all those things on the right, like the car, the vending machine, those are all things, right? So they all have concepts related to them. Um, 
Likewise, uh, the person might be pulling up their phone, and instead of looking for a list, they might actually search for something. And that search string would also have um, a set of concepts associated with it. So what you can do is kind of feed these both into a knowledge graph and compare the concepts of the things that are around you with the concepts of the things that you searched for. And already you have this kind of new way of discovering and, and finding and interacting with things in the room around you. But that's kind of more of a blue sky sorting. So I've talked about the kind of general high level experience, but um, when thinking about this, we kind of landed on three kind of core use cases for the physical web. There's probably more. Um, but these are the ones that kind of stand out the most. And the first one is called the simple web. And the simple web um, is basically, think like, we think that there's going to be lots of devices out there eventually, that all they're doing is sprouting like little bits of information. So in this case, you might be at a museum exhibit. And this museum exhibit might be broadcasting a URL. And the user could open up their phone and, and discover that this, this URL is being broadcasted from this nearby thing, and then go to that URL and receive more information about this exhibit. It could be maybe something created by the museum. It could be a Wikipedia page. It's really up to whoever's entering this URL. But it's this really simple idea, right? Like all you're doing is pointing people to more information. And this idea alone opens up this whole new uh, realm of interactions with things nearby. And think of it like a, I hate to say this, but think of it like a super awesome QR code that you can use across the room and it doesn't have all the UX problems of taking a picture and anyone can use it at the same, it's like, it, it, it's not bounded, you can't, like with QR codes where you have to be like, have like only five people at once can even take a picture, but like with this beacon that's broadcasting, the whole room can inter interface with this at once. The next use case is called the cloud pass-through. And so if you remember in the last example in the simple web, it was very unidirectional, right? It was just like this thing's broadcasting a URL, your device sees it and then goes to a web page. This case is bidirectional in that you're interacting with the thing in front of you. So it's two-way two, two uh, directionality. So for example, the user passes by a vending machine, which is broadcasting a URL. Then they go to that page and receive a purchasing page. And after they buy the drink, the server would then tell the vending machine to spit out the drink. So this is kind of cool because, I mean, there's probably better use cases for this, but um, you, don't, you're, you don't have to be in the same network as this device that you're interacting with. That's pretty powerful stuff in terms of an interaction paradigm. Like, so you're not installing an app, you're interacting with the device, and you don't have any stuff in your phone afterwards. So the last use case is what we're calling direct connect, and it's very similar to the cloud pass-through, except there's a subtle difference. So in this case, you'll be, um, you'll happen upon a quadcopter, which happens pretty often, right? And it's broadcasting a URL. You go to that page, and it returns maybe say like a set of controls or joysticks for piloting this drone. Then what's also coming under the hood um, in this page would be a set of JavaScript Bluetooth libraries that you could use to initiate a direct connection to this device. And we're imagining that this sort of uh, direct connection would be most suitable for situations where you requ require low latency, right? Like, you need like a real-time feedback loop, like for, in this case, when you're, you're piloting something. And then you can start flying it, and there it goes. Um, so the, the physical web, in summary, is it takes URLs and injects them in the physical world. And then we're assuming that there are devices out there that would eventually be able to discover these URLs, discover these devices, and then those URLs will take you to either more information or to a way to interact with these devices that are nearby. So it's interaction on demand. And an important point here is to note that this is just like a thin discovery layer that we're thinking would be on top of the web, right? It's, it's a springboard or platform to get you into the Internet of Things. And so we started uh, building out our ideas, and it's, I mean, this is a community project. We want this to be an open spec. And so we started um, compiling this information. You can learn more about Physical Web at physical-web.org. And we also have a link to our GitHub page where we've been building out some experimental prototypes that we think showcase some of the core concepts that I've been talking about today. But really, this is, if this is going to succeed, or if, it's, or if, we, if we think it's useful, 
you know, it's got to be community driven and needs to be open and everyone's good ideas need to be, you know, brought to the table. Um, and that's how it makes something really cool. And that's the physical web. Thank you. So it was a little short talk, but uh, does anyone have any questions? Can you talk a little about security consideration? I mean, it's very easy to s do phishing and all that, like plug a tandem on a zip car and look like it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's something we definitely need to consider. We haven't been touching it too much. In fact, right now, um, this, in this spec, things are broadcast in the clear, right? And we're thinking this would be initially starting in like public places. But yes, we certainly would need to consider some form of encryption or, or basically figuring out what we've learned from URLs already and try to apply those same techniques to, to the security model for the beacons. Um, sorry if you already covered this, but um, is Google or W3C pushing this spec? I'm sorry? Is Google or W3C or anyone else pushing this? Well, it's not, it's not a Google product and we're not shipping it. Um, it's meant to be an open experimental community project. Um, but I don't know of anything related to the W3C as of yet. But that'd be pretty cool if it happened. <laughs> Nobody? All right, thank you.